Shut up and sit down. Hi and welcome to the first ever Tiki Sessions from Con Tiki Bar in Portrush. I'm Stuart Cullen from Rawway Board Company and joining me on this journey over the next month or two is Ash, who's head barman for Con Tiki in Portrush. Ash, how's things? I'm good mate, thank you. Um, really, really glad to have Alan here along tonight. Um, Alan, I've made you a nice mocktail here. Um, I know you like your cup of tea, but I've made you a nice Tiki mocktail um, and we're going to hopefully get things, get things started. Absolutely, tell me a bit more about it. So we've got a mixture of grenadine in here, fresh pineapple juice, a little bit of sugar and a little bit of fresh lemon. Garnished. I thought you said it was a mocktail. <laughs> there is, it is a mocktail. I'll get you a nice paper straw here because we're being good for the environment. And you didn't are. actually mention where the tiki bar was. People would think this is an underground bunker somewhere. Yeah, so yeah, I'm so delighted to be here in Portrush in the iconic uh, boat bar, Kelly's Portrush. Um, we're going to make this into a really exciting, really energetic tiki bar. And um, I'm so glad to have you along because you've, you've, you've had such a rich history in this venue and I hope to add to it and, and looking forward to, to making some cracking tiki drinks for it. I'm looking forward to it as well, but I'm going to ask a question for the uninitiated. Okay. What's a tiki bar? For me, I, I wanted to name the bar after a famous boat and it's where Western culture meets Polynesian culture and that's why I picked up the name. Most people who have, if you've ever read the book called Contiki, um, it's a famous boat where a, a bunch of Swedish guys basically floated on a raft over to South America. And that's why I wanted the, a, a famous boat to have that sort of nod to the famous name. Tiki bars generally are really fun bars where we make uh, like lovely rum punches. I'm going to have a real focus on rum, tequila, mezcal. We're going to make some amazing drinks. It's going to be table service and it's going to be something that locals will, will really love. Um, Imagine that. Drink, fun and a bar and Kelly's. It's hard to Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> yeah. What a strange recipe, eh? And I think I think that uh, if we if we go right back, I think James Kelly, who we all know, who had a, 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 what's what Kelly's named after, um, he had a, a, a tiki bar here previously called Bamboozle. Um, you'll know all about this better than me. But um, and then this, I think this in its current format was brought in about twenty years ago, and it's been it's been sitting sort of gathering dust for the last couple of years, and I'm really really excited about turning turn it into a tiki bar and, and getting some locals back in and enjoying a bit of crack. Well, listen, I'll tell you what, the atmosphere in this particular bar, the boat bar, you mentioned Marino Morelli mm -hmm. and you mentioned the boat bar. And this, w this was the, the gathering place. People used to gather here as the sort of the heart of Kelly's before they went anywhere else. And they'd meet up with everybody in here. They'd have a few jars in here, banter with Marino and the crack in here was brilliant. You know the way people say, oh, it'll be great crack. To me, you can never say something's going to be great crack because yeah. you don't know. But in here was, it was like the, the universe centre of crack. And then everybody went to all the different rooms. It was a perfect, perfect circuit venue Absolutely. Like where you walk around. And, and for me, like I did a, during COVID restrictions last year, just when, when it was eased a little bit, I did a hen party in here. And they, the ladies were so excited to be in here. Mm. The nostalgia of being in here. And I'll not say too many stories that they told me, um, but they had such a good time in here. And the, the nostalgia of being back in here. And it's just steeped in it. We've all we've all sort of cut our teeth drinking in Kelly's in this bar. I remember plenty of stories of being in here, probably when I shouldn't have been, probably when you were not letting me in at the front door at times, Alan, but somehow you managed to sneak away and, and have a wee sneaky drink. But oh, great that you're here. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm so stoked that you've come along, so thank you. Yeah. So, Al, you and me, I was thinking about it last night, we have 25-year history, probably. Um, I think the first time I met you was through the great late Seamus Lockery. Um, and, uh, Did I give you an impression I'd finished? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And um, Seamus brought me across to do some visuals in Kelly's because of my video background. Um, and I met you and that was 25 years ago. And we've, we've worked together on a million different projects over that time. We've known each other for so long, both as friends and through work, work colleagues. But before I met you, and way back in the day, you were over in London. And this I is was, where I, yeah. I sort of want to start with you because this is the period of your life I don't know much about. <laughs> other than, than I know that you were there and I know that you were in London during an amazing time. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, it would take an awful long time because it, <laughs> yeah. honestly it was a colourful and most incredible time to be in London. I was in London uh, just at the start of punk. Uh, well, I say not just at the start of punk, uh, but halfway through. Uh, my first connection with punk was actually going to 
uh, a shop on the King's Road uh, called uh, World's End. Okay. And we went into World's End and it was a really strange shop. They had a clock on the front, massive big clock, and the clock went backwards. Right. Okay, so it turned back time. And you went inside and the girl that worked in it, Jordan, she had white peroxide hair and, and it was tied to a railing and she walked she walked up and down with her hair tied to the railing. But that was the nucleus for Vivian Westwood. Brilliant. So it was all Vivian Westwood clothes. And this was Vivian Westwood just starting out. Yeah. So we were buying Vivian Westwood's clothes and then Malcolm McLaren came along and the next thing you know, hey ho, let's go, <laughs> it's time for the Sex Pistols. That's it. So you had the Sex Pistols, I was living in Labrick Grove at the time, uh, you had the Clash knocking around there as well. Then it moved on into the sort of new romantic phase, Spandau Ballet, uh, Boy George, he was all knocking around the, the, uh, the new romantic scene where everybody was dressed up, like I mean, whenever I say dressed up, I mean dressed up. This was like Studio 54, only a London, you know, yeah. New York, only a London version. And it was a great time because it's, it seemed to be a, a melting pot for an awful lot of people from all over the UK who, for various reasons, the epicenter was London. Yeah. The, and, you know, Manchester was grey and rainy and dull. Liverpool was just bleak, but London was the, was a shining light. And it really was the centre of the universe for all that was happening in in art, in fashion, in music, and you know all the things I was into. When when you were in London, what was were you studying there, or what was it that you were doing in London? Because <laughs> you're originally from here, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So so what took you to London, and what were you doing when you were in London? Uh, it's it's the strangest story in the world because <laughs> the night before I went, <laughs> the night before I went to London, there was a competition in Belfast for the Northern Ireland DJ of the Year. Uh, I went along to it. I was the only DJ from outside Belfast. I won it. And as I was walking up to get the award, the other DJs from Belfast were throwing bottles at me. <laughs> I'm sorry, hey, I'm sorry, hey, hey, but I left the following day and went to London with some of my friends. Yeah. And again, it was just a huge adventure. I was in the rag trade in London. And as I say, it was a whole, the whole fashion art thing was just incredible. Did you take part in the fashion, Alan? Did I take part in the fashion? Did you just stay watch from afar or did you actually get involved? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Every, everybody got involved. That's what I'm saying. When, yeah. Whenever you went to a club then, yeah. they, you dressed up. You dressed up. You know, we, uh, say for instance, one week we'd all be in 50 zoot suits, you know, yeah, and I, yeah. whenever I say zoot suits, I mean the proper suits, the shirts, the ties, the, the shoes, the whole works. The next week you might be in an American Civil War pair of pyjamas <laughs> with a French beret. You know, nice. it was like, it was pretty out there. And so what was the music scene then? Was there the, uh, like dance as it is now? It was obviously coming through with, as you say, punk, new romantic, and then it was sort of on that journey. There was a little bit of electronica coming in as well. You know, uh, the DJs around there, Rusty Egan, who was running the Camden Palace, which was the main club. And then you had Heaven, which was strictly gay, 100% a gay club. But that's where all the Chicago house music was yeah, happening. Was that, was, that all came through there. But where I was going, the likes of Camden Palace, it was a little bit of electronica. It was early, early Depeche Mode, Yazoo, early so Spanish. Like a Ballet. reggae, got a ska scene. Was that before? Or? There was a reggae ska scene, but uh, that again, that was there were small pockets. Right, you know, right. I lived in Labrick Grove, Grove, which was just right beside Notting Hill, and I was very lucky because a friend of mine, Phil, uh, his his mother was Afro Caribbean. Right. So we were able to sneak into some of the Caribbean nice. private parties. And, uh, you know, uh, you, th <laughs> you would have done very well, put it that way, with uh, your exotic range of drinks, because yeah. all they had was, uh, it was like a shutter that you would go for a burger <laughs> and chips, and it was Red no Stripe. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, Red yeah, Stripe. Yeah. Red That's all they drank. There was nothing else. I mean, nothing else. By the way, we've cans of Red Stripe yeah. in this bar. And, a, sure. and, <laughs> and huge, big uh, dub reggae sound Class. systems. Oh, and as I think I mentioned to you earlier on about, you know, the class used to knock around and listen to the, the sound systems. And that, you know, you can, you, you can hear the influence of the, the reggae and the dub coming through in their, cool. their music as they progressed. And did that influence what you were playing then as a DJ as well? Or, you know, did you... 
did you have the same style that you were playing here in Northern Ireland? And did you stick with that when you went to London, or you obviously evolved? I would assume in, in the music. Oh, to to you're listening to so totally much evolved. Variety. There was a there was a record shop. Well, it wasn't a record shop as such. It was called the Cage in uh, a market in the King's Road, and everybody used to go down there a Saturday morning. All the new tunes would come in. Rusty would be playing them, and the other thing was, so many of the bands were there as well. Yeah. You know, because so many of the bands were based in London, and you got the, you got the chance to, to talk to the bands like Vince Clark from Yazoo, he was always knocking around. Uh, you had Heaven Seventeen, they were around. So it was that that new sort of English electronica, yeah. You know, which was it was exciting. And then after that, you obviously came back to Northern Ireland. What was Kelly's like, and what was the idea behind Kelly's, and where was it? What was the future? The hope of the future at that stage? Well. It all boils down to James Kelly mm -hmm. and his vision. James Kelly was so far ahead of his time, it was unbelievable because I came back and I was telling him about things that were happening in London and he was like, oh yeah, I heard of that, let's do some of that, right? But his ethos was, doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what colour you are, what age you are, you're going to come and have a good time. Brilliant. So, because of the scale of Kelly's, which I, I, I remember looking at lots of old photographs of the hotel whenever it started, and it, to a certain extent, it's, there's a lot of the original hotel yep. there, and various bits just started being added on. It was like a, James Kelly's massive Lego set, <laughs> all these various bits. <laughs> but again, because there was different styles of music around at that time, say for instance, downstairs you had indie music, yep. Upstairs, you had, I suppose, commercial and, and sort of poppy oh, dance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then you had live bands as well, and uh, the uh, the white Ple the white pheasant, or as we called it, the quite pleasant. That became the base for young farmers. Yeah. So if somebody said to you, you're going to mix young farmers with goths, right, and with metal heads and teeny pop girls, you think, no, no, not in a million years. But as Ash was saying earlier, you had a bass here, okay? And say for instance, you were into uh, electronica and dance, you could go upstairs and stay there all night. Or if you're into indie, you'd go downstairs. But the other great thing was, you could mix. You could, you could dip a toe a in the water. For, from my point of view, like the, the whole, and again, probably I'm coming a wee bit later than you boys, obviously, but um, the, for me, the, obvious, 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 like, <laughs> the, the sync playing hip hop, going into absolute dance bangers, and it wasn't commercial dance, it was sort of underground, it was mm -hmm. a lot of electronica and real good house music, and then being able to float about and then come into here for a bit of a breather and have a sit down, mm -hmm. have a beer, or go downstairs for a bit of indie music was just. It was brilliant. There was nowhere offering that. No, my, but that my point again, as I said to you, was you look, you look at the mix of people yeah, that you saw around exactly. this this That's the thing, venue. Me and my brother used to come every week, as you know, and the first thing we would do is we'd go and see Charlie, mm -hmm. and we'd get four drinks each, and then we would do what we called at that time a lap of Kelly's, yeah. and we would just go around and. That lap could maybe take us two and a half hours because mm -hmm. you'd be bumping into different people. Yeah. And you know, that was back whenever the sink was the garage, so before it was the sink. Yeah. And uh, you know, like you say, that there was all those, e even down in the gods, whenever at that stage you had Plug, Plug and Dominic playing mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, there was something for everyone. And you know, if I think back over Kelly's over the years, like I was here when Coolio played here, mm -hmm. I was here when Fatboy Stim played here, mm -hmm. I was here when the Cuban Brothers came, mm -hmm. the MTV Lick Party. And those are all it's like a history of music, yeah, isn't they're, it? And they're Class. all totally different genres. Yeah. And like you say, if on paper you put down this is what we're going to do as a club or as a complex, you'd be like, don't be ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. But it worked and it always worked. Yeah. And that was one of the great things about Kelly's. It was like an Irish stew of music. Yeah. And there's so many constants in it. Like, I mean, Charlie's a perfect example. I go yeah. down there and get a can of heart off Charlie. And then whenever I started coming here, James had been sitting down in Beatles with, mm -hmm. with a bottle of Holston Pills. And yeah. for me, I was always thinking about the drinks, weirdly. Yeah. You'd come up here to Merino and had whatever, and it was just a lovely Gerard Platt downstairs. Yeah, exactly. But there you go, you're, you're talking about personalities. Yeah. Exactly. You're talking about human beings. And again, that came from James Kelly School of, listen, we're all making friends here. That's it. You know, it's, you and know. that sort of filtered out between all the staff. Like I started out working with, for Charlie in here. Many's a minute ago, but it felt like a family. It felt like it was, it was such yeah, a cool very experience. Much so. I, I remember the first time I ever came to Kelly's. I may not have been of the age, and I came up to the doors at God's, and the, the door staff turned around to me at that time and went, 
son, I think it's Barry's you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I got turned, and girls from my class and school just walked straight on it. That was Alan Simpson, did that? <laughs> no, I, 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 he did that to me when I was about 15, <laughs> turned up here, and I went home to my dad, and he was like, they let you in? And I said, no, no. he said, good lad. <laughs> I actually met a doorman from Kelly's who used to turn me away oh, no last way. Sunday whenever oh, I was out oh, yeah. for a walk. Rocky, Rocky Roxburgh, and he's still he's a lovely, lovely man, but he still looks pretty scary. That was the other interesting thing about Kelly's as well. Nobody ever started any trouble yeah. because nobody wanted to be barred. No, yeah, yeah, because this was the place that they wanted to come because to because somebody somebody would start trouble and then they get barred. And all their friends would be coming here, and everybody they knew come here, and they'd be standing outside going, "What do I do now?" They can hardly sit. You can hardly sit in Shirley Diner, <laughs> Shirley's Diner all night. Look, that's it. And I, I always find the door staff brilliant in Kelly's. Marshall, Jason, um, you know, all of them were always friendly, and they were always really good. Um, and even now, you see them kicking about Port Rush, and yeah. they always stop, and they remember mm -hmm. you from back in the day. And even you know the bar staff, Charlie and Frankie, and all of them. You know, it was, well, it was a rite of passage, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, so one of the big things, obviously, with Kelly's was the birth of Lush, and I think Lush has now had over twenty years um, in the making. I, I remember being here on opening night. I remember the first birthday, and one of the great things about Lush and the thing that always really gets me is we're a tiny little part of North, a tiny little country, Northern Ireland, but yet we do, as people and as businesses, we do phenomenal things. And Lush has had some of the biggest DJs in the world play. What were those DJs like? Were any of them really sound, which I'm sure they were, but were any prima donnas or, you know, the DJs come in, just do what they were meant to do um, and move on, or did you just build relationships with them? Great question. And the answer, it's quite long-winded, yeah. but I always thought of uh, Portrush has been a microcosm of Northern Ireland. And I always said, the problem in Northern Ireland, had a few wee problems, we used, we used to not like each other and all that, carry <laughs> on, but we get on all right now. But whenever we, even whenever we weren't getting on very well, people were never too sure about coming here. But I used to, I used to call it the Gate 18 syndrome. If you could get the people from Gate 18 mm -hmm. in Heathrow and get them on that plane and get them here, you can guarantee they'd be back. Yeah. You had to get them here yeah, first. Too, but yeah. once you once you got people here, and I I had quite a few tricks, but one of my favourite tricks was uh, I'd go and pick the DJs up from the airport myself. So chat away to them. If you've never met them before, yeah. you know you want to make them feel sort of comfortable. You want to have a bit of banter with them. If they're tired, they've just some of them maybe just flown in from New York the night before, or someone been in Ibiza for a week and stuff like that, and might be tired. So we'd chat away, chat away for a while. And uh, and I would I would go quiet at Bally Boogie, <laughs> and I would say nothing, nothing at all. And just just as you're coming over the peak of the hill, just before the, the Royal Court, yeah. I would go. Uh, so you've never been here before, and they go oh, and then they see that view. Yeah. And once you see that view for the first time, and you are not expecting it, of the scaries and the it's just it blows everybody away and i mean everybody and at that time am i right in saying the djs all stayed in the royal court as well mm -hmm. a lot and of them so, did. So, yeah, you yeah. know that's an amazing view oh, absolutely especially if they're coming from inner cities in, in england yeah. that's an amazing view to wake up to in the morning yeah and also the crowds the cr in my head i don't know what you know a lot more but the crowds in northern ireland seem to just go for it and i imagine the djs yeah. are can see that difference oh, absolutely. And love feed off absolutely well uh the Live at the Beach sessions for uh, Norman Cook, Pop Boy Slim. They were born uh, sitting up in the honeymoon suite looking out over uh, the East Strand oh, Beach. Brilliant. They're legendary gigs. Yeah, because we were just chatting and, and I think somebody said, you know, why don't you just play some of the best beaches in the world? And I said, if you ever do, you're coming back us, here. That's right. it. And yeah. he, I, actually, I saw Norman a couple of months ago, uh, pre COVID, and I saw. I saw it was quite funny. I went to get a bacon sandwich at his cafe, and he was serving Brilliant. the bacon sandwiches. Awesome. Yeah. So, and that's uh, in Brighton. And I think that cafe is actually featured in his publicity for his new UK tour as well. Is it? Because he, he's in serving. He's it in Morgan, and, yeah. And, and, yeah, and he, he gets a phone call, and he just goes, "It's on." And it's the yeah. UK tour, but he's not coming to Belfast. So I'm no. screaming at him on but social media about that. Going back to the DJs, you know. <laughs> Yes, superstar DJs getting paid a ridiculous amount of money. Yeah. But I was used to say, right, okay, listen, you're now in Northern Ireland. 
you know, you're here for a bit of fun. We're easy going people. Yes, I'm sorry, maybe last night you were staying in Dubai in a seven star hotel. Maybe we don't have all the frills, but we've got the people and we have the atmosphere. And we proved that once they come on, that the first five minutes in Lush, yeah. they were blown away. And I could safely say without exception that they were all great. Mm -hmm. Honestly, they were all great people, even the likes of Tiesto, who had never been to Northern Ireland before, ever. And we brought them here for the first time. And again, you know, you got to think of these people in Northern Ireland. What? So you did have to pamper them a bit. But once once they put their first tune on, that was it. Yeah. That um, was it. The people, the people did the rest. The crowd did the rest. That's it. And, you know, dance music isn't overly my thing. But again, on a Saturday night in Kelly's with one of the best DJs in the world on, the place is bouncing, mm. absolutely bouncing, and you make friends, and the, the atmosphere, and everything's great. And I always think it would be great to go back and do a documentary on Kelly's, because the amount of people that must have met their husbands, their wives, their best mates on that dance floor. Their future ex-wives. Their future ex-wives <laughs> and their future ex-ex-wives and stuff like that. So, Kelly's is on the outskirts of Port Rush, and Port Rush is a place that you hold firmly in your heart. Port Magic, baby. So what's special about Port Rush for you? What's special about Port yeah. Rush? It is, it has, it has the magic, uh, the Port Magic. It's not like anywhere else. Uh, one of the things I love about Port Rush is the horizon. Mm -hmm. You come down, you have it at East Strand, you have it at West Strand. It's just, it's magnificent. It doesn't matter if it's howling in the middle of February and it's freezing, you're looking out. I just, I, I love the weather. I love it. Uh, I actually love as well the way that, to a certain extent, we undersell ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, I suppose maybe it's a Northern Ireland thing, we don't like telling people how good we are. You know, you look at our surfing, mm -hmm. some of our surfers are the best in the world. That's yeah. it. You look at the Gulf, ain't, ain't no other uh, town or city in the world that has two Open Champions from that town. Absolutely. None. Nowhere else in the world. Uh, so you have the golf, you have the surf, uh, you have the social scene, you have the bars, you have the nightclubs, you have the restaurants. But again, it's it, it comes down to the old Kelly thing. It's about the people. Mm -hmm. There is a warmth. There is a warmth about the Portrush local. You know, there really, really is, and they're proud. Mm -hmm. Portrush people are very, very proud of where they come from, and. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to be negative, but I have to be realistic as well. And some of the things that are happening in 2021 are not to the liking of a lot of the locals because here on the north coast it has become very much of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. it, it's the, the, the place that people want to be, and it was going that way before COVID. And then once COVID arrived, people weren't getting away to their Marbez and their Greece and their Spain. So they were coming here. It's accelerated things, isn't it? Yeah, but they forget that they're not in Marbella. Mm -hmm. You know, they forget that they're not in Porto Benus. This is Port Rush, this is Northern Ireland. Don't be at right? <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Right? Yeah. You know, don't get ideas above your station. You know, just enjoy yourself. We, our standards are very, very good. Standards of food, surfing, blah, 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 everything that we do. But, you know, don't be a dick. Well, this is one of the things, Ash and myself, one of the reasons we're doing these tiki sessions is, you know, we had a long conversation about, again, we come from this small area on the north coast of Northern Ireland, and we were talking and we were going, right, let's think music, you know, from the Triangle area, Henry McCulloch, and so I watch you from afar, loads of artists, surfers, you know, Big Al Meany, uh, and you know, we've got a couple of surfers coming up in the next couple of weeks that we're going to be talking yeah. to as well. Andy Hill. Andy Hill, European TK, champion. TK, Ricky. That's it. Big Hanno. John exactly. You know, John. John. Hey. Yeah, John. John. He's just been the most. Exactly. The boy. You, you've, you've, <laughs> got, you've got the uh, you've got the golfers. You've got um, Irish female hockey players. Um, th there's just, from a 12 miles triangle area, mm -hmm. If you took the percentage of people and expanded it out per head of population, we are bound to be at the top of the league for the probably well, in the world for the most successful people. As far as major golf champions, we've got more golf. Cha we've got more major golf champions from Port Rush than Canada. Yeah, that's amazing. Exactly. Well, the beauty for me is that most people are quite unassuming, and they'll, you know they don't they don't walk about like they own the place or whatever. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of Port Rush. You can walk in and. 
meet a celebrity or whatever and bump into your mate and it's all just very and that promenade west strand and when you mention the horizon weirdly i always picture if i think of west strand i think of a cruise ship and i think of you stand up paddleboard that, that, that's what i was going to say and you i know. think of you like if i look out there i see big al like, on a stand up paddleboard in his shorts I'm thinking is he going to fall in will he fall in <laughs> i always want to see him fall in <laughs> but he never bloody does how did you get into the paddleboard uh i'm not a I'm not mad for group activities mm -hmm. and team sports, unless it's the mighty Korean. Which go, <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, but no, uh, I suppose five, six years ago, and uh, nobody was doing it. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing it at all. And it was my friend, uh, Riggy Robinson. And Riggy got me onto it. And I started doing it in the winter. Mm -hmm. I started doing it in the winter in the harbour in Port Rush. And then I would go a little bit further, and a little bit further, and a little bit further. And I have to say, it's just, it's my thing. I can just, that I can get on the board the and best. disappear. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the cruise ship, you know, it is actually amazing to go out there and just look up and go, oh my God. Exactly, because wow. it's huge looking from the shore, but if yeah, you're out sure right, right below it. Yeah. And for me, like stand-up paddleboard has been a, a huge thing for me. And like from, from sort of a, a positive mental health thing for me, when you can leave your phone at the beach, you are uncontactable mm -hmm. out there and you're paddling, you're totally focused on because you have to engage your core, you have to be in the moment, but you've got this most beautiful scenery that not a lot of people have seen in Port Rush. The, the vantage From points, there, yeah, absolutely, it's, it's, it's incredible, really, really beautiful, and, and the caves and the little nooks and the gorgeous, corners, really yeah. and, and, then, and then the white. Like you tell me, is there a better experience in the world than going along on your paddleboard about two miles out and you look down and there's two or three dolphins, <laughs> cold water away? Exactly. So you mentioned your uh, other love, Korean FC. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the smile on his face with that <laughs> one. Like you know. So. Tell us, you know, you're obviously heavily involved with Korean FC over the years. Um, they've done phenomenally well in the last four or five years. Um, before that, there was very hard times yeah. as well. True supporter the whole way through, always stuck with them. It's always hard being a football supporter. It's, yeah, been a proper, <coughs> being a proper supporter. <laughs> being yeah. a proper real supporter through the highs and lows. Uh, yeah, Korean Football Club. You know, I, the first time I ever went, my uncle Sammy, who had a butcher shop in the waterside in Korean, took me along and I sat in the wall uh, just in front of the railway end. And I uh, was away in England and doing other things and didn't go for a long time. But I suppose over the last 15 years or so, I, I try and not miss a game. And it is just, it is the passion. And it's, it, there is something incredible about being close to somebody and watching them do what you would just love to be able to do. And I, I'm, I was lucky enough to have uh, a radio career, right? Where I met some of the biggest stars in the world. Like Dolly Parton sat on my knee, for goodness sake. My wife I, was very jealous about that. Yeah, Massive but, country fan, so yeah. But to me, it's just another human being, just yeah. a bit of crack. Uh, like there's loads and loads of people I can mention, I don't like all that nonsense. But the only person that I was ever starstruck with in the entire world, ever, was Stephen Carson, who played for Korean. Really? Yeah. I used to get, I'm like, loveliest fella from Balamone, and we chat, but I was always nervous around him because I just think he was a phenomenal, phenomenal talent. Phenomenal. And, you know, people I think are realizing now, whenever, whenever they see, the Premier League in England mm -hmm. without the crowds yeah. and without the atmosphere and then they see an Irish League match they go oh, hold on a minute and like you know those boys are tough but they also there's this thing about oh it's, it, it's a tough league you know they're mad tackles yeah but there's a heck of a lot of skill as well yeah. a heck of a lot of skill and the thing about Corey and, and I have to pay tribute to Oren Kearney mm -hmm. uh, an amazing manager an amazing man manager mm -hmm. who can bring people from various places put them together and mold them into like a proper team how happy were you when he came back oh just whenever <laughs> i get the phone call over the moon over the moon and uh, no no disrespect to rodney mcgarry rodney's a friend of mine uh but oren he just has that we're talking about earlier the the magic that's it he has yeah, the magic so at the fear of getting lynched as somebody who's never been to korea match is it like in my head it's not like because i would love to bring my kids and we we do follow football from yeah, afar yeah. but 
Is it somebody you could bring? Like I have totally. a, a, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. One hundred percent. A good crack, Brian. A, especially, especially really Korean. Cool. Especially Korean. The stand is full of families. Nice. It really okay. is. And the club shop is really good. Now you can go to get all the kit for the kids, Brilliant. replica tops. And that was one of the great things over the last few years. The club shop really took off. And I st and honestly, it just made me feel so good around the triangle area instead of seeing Liverpool and Man United replica kits you'd see kids wearing Korean kits yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was like yeah and yeah. no it's a great family atmosphere I think, I think that's the thing like for engaging families and for, like I have a lot of mates who've moved away and they've all seemed to come back and we talked about this the other day about how it's it's almost magnetic the north yeah. coast and like we're all here talking about the future of Portrush and, and like for me I'm so excited about this and I keep going on about it but like, what does the future hold for Kelly's? Now that you're back on board, mm -hmm. what's the, the positives that we can look forward to other well, than here, obviously? Well, nobody has a nobody has a crystal ball, yeah. but you have to take chances. You know, you have to, you know, you think about an idea and you just go, well, that work, we'll give it a go. Yeah. We'll give it a go. And lucky enough, Peter Wilson has, has got the kahunas to try something different and something different is definitely coming along you say about the tiki bar here uh there's going to be an outdoor nobody really knows this yet uh an exclusive, yeah, <laughs> yeah a, a, a fully undercover uh village Brilliant. an entertainment village for the whole family whether it is daytime entertainment whether it is nighttime entertainment you look back to whatever era in the world it doesn't matter the 30s the 40s the 50s or 60s or 70s whatever People always wanted to be entertained. Mm -hmm. There was always stages, you know? And it didn't matter whether it was a comedian, a hypnotist, a band, uh, a juggler. It's entertainment. So that's hopefully what we're gonna, we're gonna do in the future. But also it's gonna be a community hub through the day. Uh, if you wanna come, the local barber will be here. You can get a cup of coffee. Well, I, I don't get that all, so <laughs> you get your nails. Uh, but does, but you can get yeah. your nails done. You got brow bar. Uh, there'd be a we wellness, uh, fitness area as well. Sure. Pilates, yoga, and then in the evening uh, we have cabanas, which hold maybe about twenty people each. They're split ten on one side, ten on the other. Uh, Wi-Fi, heat, television. You know. You're on your holidays the minute you walk into one of those, and it, there will be full bar and table service. Uh, two amazing wood-fired pizza ovens, really, really top of the range pizzas, uh, but uh, just a really good space. And it's it's all enclosed under a huge, big festival style. Mm -hmm. it, it does it a disservice by calling it a marquee because it's not a marquee, yep. but and it's not an awning either. It's just a great big. Cappuccino coloured cloud yeah. that engulfs everything and it, it will feel like a, a village because you can wander around through the day and then in the evening again you'll have the cabanas which are we're calling it a cabana because I suppose it, it's a cross between a, a ski lodge and a beach hut and maybe a, a holiday villa Brilliant. You know, they're, they're, they're really, really comfortable. And I think from it, from my point of view, like at the minute I'm, I'm doing an awful lot of work and, and teaching hospitality and teaching kids like to get into bartending and, and the, hospitality, the hospitality industry. And one anecdote that I always use is something that I experienced with you on years ago. It was when May McFedrich was doing the cabaret nights up here. And my dad, God help you dad, had clearly not booked the tickets. But he walked up there and as we were walking up, I don't know what age I was, maybe 15, 16. And you seen him and said, Big Ray, don't worry about it. And he said, I he clearly had said to you, I haven't fucking booked down, but whatever. You rolled out a table, you got us to the front, we had the best night. May didn't even pick on us, I don't know why he didn't pick on us, but we had the best night ever. And to me, that's. Who's going to pick on your dad? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, like, for me, that's old school hospitality. And that's one thing I, like, I keep drilling into people getting into hospitality trade to say, and Kelly magnifies it beautifully, just to say, make people feel welcome. And I think that's, for me, what I want to achieve here and what Kelly's have done for years. And that was the perfect example that night of you rolling out, literally rolling out the table for Big Ray. Well, a lot of people make a mistake in hospitality and they go into, <laughs> they go into hospitality and they don't like people. Yeah. You know, yeah, you yeah. have to love people. Yeah, totally. Because <laughs> you know, that's what you're engaging with all yeah. the time. And it's great to hear people's stories. And I, I, you know, you, you, you're doing this here. I've been in hospitality for so many years. And I just love people developing their social skills. Mm -hmm. You know, kids working behind a bar who are like, ooh, 
they're as timid as a kitten and then just give them a little bit of time and you can see them and they grow totally. it's, a pa it's a passage that they it go is, through yeah. so we're talking about entertainment and we're going to finish well up you mentioned Do you mentioned dolly or i mentioned dolly part yeah. there <laughs> yeah well you know, you could have a Dolly Parton tribute act down there. You could have an Ed Sheeran lookalike. You could have Rod Hogg doing his world. There's another thing: a world class that's magic show. That's world it. class. Yeah, there will be entertainment for everybody, and it's taking it right back to the East Os where we started at the very, very start. And doesn't matter if you're a farmer driving a tractor from Akidui, right, or you're a long-haired metalhead, mm -hmm. or if you're and the hip hop doesn't matter. There'll be something here for you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Absolutely. So, you obviously had your BBC career. I think it was seven years that span. Yeah. Um, you interviewed a wealth of people, like you said, Dolly Parton, John Cleese, One Direction. There's only one person I really want to ask you about, <laughs> and it's Vernon Troy. So he's 81 centimeters tall. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, uh, many me from Austin Powers. Um, he's 81 centimetres tall and you're beyond 81 mm -hmm. centimetres tall by probably a metre or two. Yeah, six foot five. Six foot five. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's a hell of a height difference. Whenever you're interviewing somebody like that, yeah. and you know, a Hollywood star, does that even cross your mind before you start that interview? Well, I did. And uh, I, I did something which I thought, this is a bit silly, and, but he laughed and it was good. But we took it a bit far because I thought to myself, right, uh, You'll understand this with doing lights and cameras and what have you. You imagine I'm up here, he's down there, he probably has to shout up to me out there. So I, the first thing I did was I got down on my knees, right? But even then I was, about, I was about three <laughs> times the size of him. Yeah. So what I decided to do was to get the equilibrium. I got him a chair and I got myself a chair. And I sat way, way down in the chair. And got him slightly higher so that we were but that, aren't you? it was a unique experience because he is or he was god rest him he's what is yeah. it, he's actually that height there but a very very funny guy yeah great cool. but yeah it was it was the dynamics and i thought right i the one thing i always wanted to do during and i will never use the word interview because I, I, I never interviewed anybody I always had a chat, chat with them yeah uh, I wanted to make them feel comfortable, mm -hmm. so that's what I did with him. I got down, so we we're both at. I yeah. and that, that was a that was a live public interview as well. I think yeah, that was Victoria uh, Square. It was, yeah, yep. yeah, it was outside Victoria Square. So just before we finish up, then one of the last things I want to ask you about, and this this comes from my parents, really, is you're out and about Portrush <laughs> every day. So you're every day, and you always stop and talk to my parents every time. Oh, they're my lovely, <laughs> and you must. You know, uh, you can't possibly go for a walk for 20 minutes, you know, because you're probably stopping every 30 seconds to talk to someone else. Do you ever get fed up with it? Uh, no, I don't. No, I don't. But my, <laughs> my girlfriend loves it whenever we go to, whenever I go to London. Or, uh, this, this is true. She, I thought her not in because we walk. Yeah, that's, I, I love chatting to people. Mm -hmm. Like, I love people. I love hearing their stories and, and people are very giving with their stories. Uh, but she just, it took her a bit of time to get used to it. And we, <laughs> we went on holidays to Italy and we went to a small, uh, a small hill town in Tuscany and we're walking down the street the first morning and somebody goes, oh, Calm, how are you? <laughs> it is that thing. And I think that's one of the most special things about this area is that even if you only know somebody a little bit, they're still your mate, they're still mm. your buddy, and you can still sit down and talk to them yeah. for 20, 30 minutes. There, there's no pretense with no. anybody. Uh, yeah, you put that very well. No, it's the one thing I, I despise is egos. Yeah. You know, ego and attitude. Ego, attitude, bad manners. No, my mother taught me that. No. That's it. No time for them. Why? Exactly. You know, just so, <laughs> what's the future bring then? Uh, Korean won in the Premier League. <laughs> uh, people from all over the world come into Portrush, and they will come to Portrush because you, you look at what the Open did for Portrush globally. There was people in every single corner of the world watching the golf. And then the following year, where we were supposed to take advantage of it, COVID. Yeah. So from now on, we're going to we're going to get the benefit of that. Again, you know yourself. 
we mentioned it about the lifestyle, the outdoor lifestyle, the walking, you know, the wellness, the sea, the surfing, you know, there, there's actually, uh, there's a dry road police now stopping, <laughs> stopping just at the Valley Castle turnoff and you're not allowed to come to Fort Rush now unless you have a dry rope and a decaf cappuccino and a vegan sausage roll. Well, that's maybe something that railway board company can expand into then over the next yeah, six yeah. months. As not well. that not that I'm saying that we're becoming gentrified or anything like no. that. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad to see that you know at least the beards are starting to disappear. Exactly, which exactly. is good. Listen, no, no, I, I think I think I think. Uh, the future's bright. It certainly is. It's uh, it's something maybe we've never had to deal with before, but we have all the tools and we have the personality to do it, mm -hmm. and we now have the premises. Yeah, brilliant, cool. Well, listen, this is our very first tiki sessions, and we literally couldn't have done it with anybody better than yourself. Um, <laughs> I, I, Everybody else is watching Master Chef with Kerry. <laughs> I know. I know. I was the only person that said, "Right, I'll do it," exactly. because I can watch it later on. But you, you said it perfectly yourself. This has been a chat, and you know, we all go back a lot of years, and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. This oh, it's great! Thanks, Alan. No, thank, no, thank you. you. And you know, again, looking to the future. The future is Port Magic. Happy days. Cheers, Alan. Thank you. Awesome. Cheers. <laughs>